Right, well, it's the finals, so it's time to go big or go home, right? I'm here to talk to you today about the single greatest engineering feat that we have ever accomplished. I want to talk to you about the device we used to put the latest Mars rover on Mars. Specifically the last bit. It can best be described as a 2.5 tonne rocket crane. It is a platform with eight rockets on the bottom of it, which managed to come slow the rover and hover above Mars. It sat there because you can't land, because the dust thrown up from the, from the rockets could damage the rover, so instead it hovers and you winch the rover down onto the surface. But to really appreciate this problem, you have to understand, to really un appreciate this solution, you have to understand the problem. So I'm going to tell you a bit more about it. So, you point your rocket at a patch of Mars so small and so far away, it's like taking a dart in this theatre and throwing it and hitting a grain of sand on a dartboard in London. You travel 550 million kilometres through the full radiation of space to get to Mars. You punch into the Martian atmosphere, blazing a trail of plasma and light at 21,000 kilometres an hour, fast enough to do London to Sydney in 50 minutes. You manage to slow down, you deploy a parachute, but you're still doing 350 kilometres an hour. So far, that was the easy bit. Easy because we know how to do this. See, the crux of the problem is that actually the rover's really big. It's bigger than most people realise. It's about the size of a jeep and weighs just under a tonne. You are now 40 seconds from the floor doing 350 kilometres an hour with no known way to stop a one-tonne rover. What's worse is that it takes 14 minutes to send messages back to Earth. But in NASA's own words, only seven minutes of terror to land the rover. You have to do all of this automatically with less computing power than it takes, with less computing power than you've got in an iPhone 5. So suddenly this seems really impressive. You have, because they did all of this first time without mistake or error, right? Because if you screw up, the rover just becomes Mars' newest $2.5 billion crater. Suddenly the idea they did this with a rocket crane is quite fantastic. It didn't go wrong, it landed perfectly and with less computing power than it takes to ang play Angry Birds. But the reason I'm telling you this, the message I want you to take is that engineering is about properly understanding the problem. What makes this the greatest feat in engineering is not the particulars of the solution. Each was one small step for science. Instead, it was, it was that we had such an understanding of this problem that we could achieve so much with so little. We literally made the impossible possible. It is very rare that science takes such giant leaps for humanity. Very poetic, Leon. Very poetic. Um, so much for so little. I, you know, the grain of sand on the dartboard, throw, I'm just thinking, what a complete and a waste of time and money. That's what I'm <laughs> thinking. And, I, you know, I used to work at Great Ormond Street Hospital with the kids. How, how do you justify so much money going into programmes that don't even work sometimes? Colin Pillinging, you know, that was just devastating when that didn't you know, when we didn't get a signal back. And, and then you go down to the kids' hospital and you've got parents with, you know, sick and dying children. How do you justify the money going into these space programs and engineering? Well, I mean, you can draw that argument for anything. So no, you I can can't. Say... I'm, I'm, I'm drawing it for this. Well, OK, so there's an argument of why go to space at all, but then you wouldn't have things like GPS, global communications, you wouldn't have things like global warming satellites, devices that are able to monitor polar ice. I don't need to spend, send a rocket to Mars to do that. No, but you need a space program, and you need to continue this. If you don't start going to Mars, you know, what's the saying? Asteroids are, nat asteroids are nature's way of asking how that space program is coming. <laughs> you know, you, you need to step... I do quite a lot of in, in sort of talking to people about sort of global sustainability. It's another one of my interests. And the more I talk to people, I come to the ever-growing conclusion that we're not going to fit 10 billion people on this tiny little marble. And you have to go to another planet. Or what's it all been for? <laughs> <laughs> and and one, one, what's your particular avenue of research, just very briefly? So I do... Um, 
hypersonic aerodynamics, which basically means I look at how air moves over things that travel incredibly quickly, which pretty much limits me to rockets, some missiles and a few airplanes. As it happens, last week I was talking to Paolo Baluta, who's the lead driver on the Mars Curiosity rover. Yeah. And he was saying the media got obsessed with the sky crane. He said the really clever thing about the landing was the aero shell being used, not just to deflect heat, but to actually steer it for the first time. Do you, do you agree? Mm, yeah, there were... I mean, when you actually look into this whole project, it's actually monumental. The, the whole bit that I said was easy was incredibly difficult. Um, it could have exploded at any given instant all the way through, all the way all that. You could have fried the electronics on the thing in the full nuclear explosion that is our sun. You finally get it there, it drops in, it heats up to about 1,000 degrees C, which is a sixth the surface temperature of the sun, for anyone that wants a reference. You then steer with the shell, as you say. You then, at some point, you've got to pop it off and get a radar lock on the floor. You've got to stop it going through your parachute. You know, you've got to, then you've got this thing with the parachute behind you. You've got to drop out of it and start the thrusters. You've then got to dodge it. That's your first job. So there's a lot of small steps that, when you really get into them, have actually what it seems like relatively simple solutions. But when you put this whole thing together with that true understanding of what you're trying to do, it becomes... Impossible. Any more questions for the judges? Yeah, I've got one. Um, my question is, uh, is actually about insects. And yeah. so I bet you saw that coming. So <laughs> what, from a sort of aerodynamic perspective, is the coolest insect mm. and why? I really like um, dragonflies. Uh, they're especially dynamic. They have a very unusual... You, you, you were at my second talk? Sorry. So I actually, do, I actually gave a FameLab semi-finals talk on this, which was... Did you? I didn't know that. Flying yeah. insects. Um, <laughs> and no, I really like <laughs> dragonflies. So they're quite... Um, there you go. If you look into it, there's two different ways that insects fly, and dragonflies are a little unusual, and uh, damselflies particularly. They're aerial predators, and they're very manoeuvrable. And they have this ability to individually articulate both of their wings. Not the whole talk, because Jim wants yeah. to go. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I would choose that one, just because okay. of the really cool, they can fly upside down, backwards, and inside out. I have a very, very quick final question. Um, you had lots of cool analogies about sort of, you know, the accuracy, the, the complexity, the speed, you know, the, whole, the whole process, and, and, and getting across the beauty of engineering. Do you think, in terms of science communication, the science in the broader sense, that we are, we are still looking for, uh, I'll um, swallow my pride and use this term, the Brian Cox of engineering? <laughs> uh, well, I hope not. He really annoys me. Um... <laughs> But do you know what I mean? I mean, engineering oh, still... <laughs> I think it's, it's important that actually scientists, you know, as your introduction said, it's really important that scientists get involved. You don't need one, one mouthy guy. No, but I, I'm generally, I mean role models. Engineering doesn't have the role models, I think, that science does. It's still the mechanic, the guy, you know, with the, you know, with the spanner or the screwdriver. Yeah. It's, it doesn't have that charisma. To some degree, you definitely need role models, and I'd love to see more scientists and engineers involved as much as I'd love to see more doctors, firemen, policemen, as opposed to just Brian Cox and footballers, maybe. Yeah. OK, I think we've got the message. One more time, please, for Liam Vanstone. <laughs>